Efendim hoş geldiniz. Bu kadar bu kadar etkili ve genç bir kalabalığı görünce müthiş etkilendiğini söylemeliyim sanatçının. Ben de öyle. Hoş geldiniz. Çağımızın en önemli sanatçılarından birisini ağırlıyoruz. Yes, translation. Acaba ses, kulaklık ya da buradan? Bir dakika. No, no. Çağımızın en önemli sanatçılarından birini ağırlıyoruz dedim gerçekten. Ve onunla bu kadar güzel bir işbirliği yaptığımız için de bütün... Sabancı ekibi namına da gerçekten hiç hiç unutmayacağımız bir süreç yaşadık. Ee, sanatçının alçak gönüllülüğü ama onun yanında da inanılmaz profesyonelliği, her şeyi burada yokken bile takip ederek her anımızı, nefesimizi bile dinlemesi bir anlamda, her anın fotoğrafını çekip ona yollayıp onun teyidini almamız, bütün bunlar bize sanatçının çalışma tarzı hakkında, titizliği hakkında, bize verdiği önem hakkında da gerçekten çok hoş anlar yaşattı. Ben şimdi sadece kenarda duracağım ve onların bu inanılmaz sohbetine şahit olacağım sizin gibi. Aybevi'yi tanıtmama gerek yok. Günlerdir yazılıyor, çiziliyor. Siz de takip ediyorsunuz bu kadar ilgiyi gösterdiğinize göre. Onunla konuşacak kişi de bu toplantıyı daha emsalsiz kılıyor. Sir Norman Rosenthal, Batı'nın sanat dünyasının, çağdaş sanatın, çağdaş sanatın ötesinde de modern sanatın gerçekten bir dünyaya tanıtımı için el, elçisi olmuş bir kişi. Royal Akademi gibi tuttu, gayet tutucu bir kuruma çağdaş sanatı sokan bir kişiden bahsediyoruz. Ve orada 40 yıla yakın oranın sergiler yöneticiliğini yapmış, sergi programlarını yapmış ve bütün dünyaya daha sonradan gidecek büyük sergileri planlamış. Ben Sir Norman'la çok iyi bir dostum benim. Uzun yıllardır birlikte pek çok proje yaptık, çalıştık ve ondan ben çok şey öğrendim. Onun dediğine göre de onun benden bir şeyler öğrendiğini söylüyor bana. İnşallah doğrudur. Ama ama bu toplantının ve bu konuşmanın onlarla gerçekten müthiş bir keyifli bir şey olacağından şüphe duymuyorum. Ben sahneyi onlara bırakıyorum şimdi. E, ve onların bu güzel sohbetini hep birlikte dinleyeceğiz. Hoş geldiniz tekrar. Nazan said nice things about me, but I suppose she did. What I want to say to begin with is that Istanbul, Ai Weiwei has given Istanbul, this city, with the help of what I call the Sabanji ladies, the ladies of the Sabanji family, and the one of my dearest, dearest friend, Nazan Ocha, the most wonderful, wonderful present, because Those of you who have seen the exhibition, I myself have seen a number of, many, many, a considerable number of exhibitions of Ai Weiwei over the years, including the extraordinary exhibition at the Tate of the Sunflower Seeds and so on, and we'll talk about that very soon. But I don't think I've ever seen a more beautiful exhibition by him. And uh, you know, given that the fact that we're living in very difficult times. I mean, my great friend, a great friend of mine, dead now for 30 years, Joseph Boyce, the famous German artist Joseph Boyce said, the truth must also be beautiful. And of course, there was an English poet of the early, early 19th century, John Keats, who said, you know, truth is beauty. Beauty, beauty is truth. And that is all that all you need, and all that is all you basically all you basically need to know. That was the kind of tenor of the famous little short epigram that he said. And I would like to ask Weiwei to begin with: 
how he regards the concept of beauty. Before we come on to more kind, that's a kind of general question, before we come on to more specific concepts and ideas that arise out of this, I think, extraordinary exhibition, which is on the ha one hand topical and on the other hand ancient. Wait, wait, do you want yeah, to answer yeah. that a little bit? Do we need this at this moment? Uh, I think now we don't need this. Maybe when we come to the questions, we will need it. I'm sure we will. Um, hello? Hello, can you all hear Mike? I think you can all hear me. Can you? Can you hear Weiwei? Hello? Wei? Hello? Hello? No? Do you have to do that? OK. Hello? OK. That's good. Uh, first, I'm very happy to be here. It's strange. I, I do feel I'm, um, I come to like a family. Um, you know, it's a place I'm very unfamiliar with, but uh, my experience here is very, very, you know, people here are very open and very friendly and uh, really want to be involved. So all those are, um, are very nice um, feelings uh, in past a few days. And to answer, uh, of course, this is before to answer a very serious question. Um, we used to say um, beauty, uh, truth, and uh, kindness, and uh, the, the beauty. You know, not, uh, we talk about those three things always related. Um, of course, then we talk about uh, as an artist, I my work very often uh, is struggling um, in between the beauty and the truth, and uh, it's sometimes it's very hard even to to to separate to to see what is the truth and what is the beauty. And uh, very often, people would say I'm an activist, not an artist, because I'm, I'm uh, constantly seeking truth and, uh, and also trying to, trying to extend my, my passion for truth into forms and shapes and uh, all different kind of expressions. And uh, sometimes, maybe successfully, so people can also say that's art, or that's, that's, this is the artist, but many uh, occasions people would also criticize my work to say this is too much political argument, uh, which I, I it's my life, you know, it's, I, I cannot avoid it. You know, it's not uh, something I can avoid. Before, I mean, well, I'd like to start at the beginning of your life, Wei Wei. I'd like to ask you some questions about what your, mem your memories of the first nine or so years of your life, when, if you like, at the height of the, you know, the, the Maoist difficult, the difficult years of Maoism. What are your memories of that time? Even what kind of bowls you were eating out of? I, well, I, I come from a society which um, I don't think people in this room would uh, really understand. Uh, of course, you can imagine. Um, the year I was born, my father was uh, 57, isn't that right? Yeah, year 57. I'm six years old. So the year I was born, my father was exiled. He was a poet. I will try to make it short. And uh, he was most beloved poet in, in, in China. So he was exiled. And uh, so family went with him to the very remote areas, uh, which is... Um, Northwest border, and Xinjiang province. Is that not the Turkic area of China? 
Well, I think no Chinese officials would like that word, but it is.、Uh, it is.、Uh, I I I start to realize the people in there have so much relation to here. But the story is, my my father spent twenty years in there. I only see because it's a kind of like military camp. It's all by the people not from the local. Uh, area, but from the people being standing there to maintain that area's so-called stability. So it's kind of semi-military camp. So we, I grew up in there. Actually, I see a few Uyghur people in 20 years. And、uh, I hope most people in the, this room will know. The, I mean, it was Nazan who taught me when we did this big exhibition at the Royal Academy. Turks, the journey of a thousand years, that Uyghurs and Turks were basically the same thing. And、uh, if you like, the story of Turkey is a st- st- story too of migration.、Mm-hmm. Yes, that's another topic. But、uh, I, I grew in, <laughs> <laughs> I grew up there, and、uh, you know the Cultural Revolution, and twenty、uh, years. It's not a short time. My father forbidden to write a, a line. You know that same time about five hundred fifty thousand Chinese so-called intellectuals being purged, and they all sent to labor camps. And many, many of them uh, uh, finished the, their life in very, very sad story. My father also committed suicide several times. But, But as a small boy, you can't have known anything else. What it was it a、uh, kind of normal life? Did you consider it to be、I、a normal life for a boy?、Time? For a boy, it's more normal life because you're given that condition. You know, you you don't know any other kind of condition. And、uh, everybody is living in very difficult time. My father, for him, is not normal because he studied in Paris、uh, in the early age, and he was going to become an artist. Then, being put in jail, then become a poet because in, still the poet uh, uh, jail still you know can produce poet. So. Um, yeah, that's that's the story. You know, the story can be too long for tonight. So maybe we just. But did、uh, but did he tell you a lot? He simply not tell me a lot, but he has a lot of poetry books. You know, and、uh, I I know he he sees those people as a friend of his, like Mayakovsky, like. Uh, Like uh, uh, uh, uh, Turkish poet、uh, Hikmeti, and、uh, also like、uh, Chile poet、uh, Ni- Pablo Neruda, no, no. you know all those poets. You know, Did he, he recite poetry to you as a he, child? He has, yeah. He he read poetry to me, and、uh, I can read very little. I was ten years old、uh, during the Cultural Revolution, but I still see he he find his own. Shelter in this most difficult time by reading poetry, so that gave me a very strong impression about what art is about. And was it through memory, or did he have access to books then?、Um, very soon after the the early days, we have to burn all the books because、uh, those books bring us too much trouble, and the people can just kick. Uh, kick open our door and、uh, just look through the books, trying to find those kind of anti-revolutionary、um, traces. So we decide to burn all those books, and、uh, it's a lot of beautiful books、uh, besides po-、uh, po- po- poetry. And we have a lot.、Uh, my father have a large collection of Western art, you know, impressionist or. Or Renaissance times, you know, or even Middle East, uh, uh, uh, uh, uh, medieval time、uh, art. So we have to burn every page, and、uh, you know, that's、uh, it. Just become、uh, to hide all those culture influence. So, nonetheless, through the Cultural Revolution, would you say, and even in the early years after it, culture was somehow part of your life. 
always. Culture is never really part of my life, but I learned all those dictators hate culture. And uh, they scared of... Uh, Who hates cultures? I didn't hear. Yeah, all those dictators, they, they, uh -huh. by nature, they, they, they, they, they don't like art. So, you know, they see art as a dangerous. They see a line of sentence can be dangerous, even they have all the power. They have a military, they have a police, they have, you know, all the power. But why they see somebody, someone as soft as my father, as the, the enemy, that really, till very later, when I was being put in jail, I start to understand. But uh, I, it's always in my mind. So, I, so Wei Wei, your, did you find that culture, I mean, when you went to New York, you went to New, you started out at an art school, isn't that right, in, in, in Beijing? And then you decided you would go to New York. Why did you go to New York? After uh, Chairman Mao passed away, I, uh, that's uh, 76, and uh, I decide that time, by 78 I got into university, that's first university opened after Cultural Revolution because they, they shut down all the university for 10 years. So once uh, I get into this film school, I realize it's not a place I should study. So I had a girlfriend in New York and uh, her family was also purged during Cultural Revolution. She, uh, she lost her mom and uh, so her relatives helped her to go to study in Pennsylvania. So she helped me to, to study abroad. I went to New York, and uh, I decided never go back to China. It's not a place I want to go back. But you were in touch with your father? No, I, for 12 years, I never went back. I, you know, once I said goodbye to him, I, I, I you, know I'm- Did you write to him? Um, Do you have communication? Almost not, because a letter would take uh, like a half month to reach him. Uh, if my mom writes back, you know, all the stories already, I, I already forget what I write to her, you know, it's, uh, it's too long to, to just get a letter back, you know, it take a month, so I decide not to write. And uh, after 12 years, my father was in hospital, so I decided to go back to China. That's 1996. Till t well, it's already quite, at least in my terms, in the terms of my life, very, very recently. I mean, huh. 1996 seems very almost like yesterday. Uh, okay. But uh, huh? do you regret going back to China in any way at all? No, not at all. You know, uh, when I was young, I uh, always naive. I always make uh, this kind of. Uh, you know, says never go back or something, but I, I went back. Even China is not uh, l not l exactly like in my memory because China has been changed a lot, you know, has uh, fast developing and have a lot of road and buildings and become a much more capitalized uh, state. Capitalist. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's not exactly in my memory, but, uh, but the time I spent there, uh, in America? In, in America, I basically, uh, I have nothing to do in New York. I, I never really got my uh, citizenship, or never really graduated from a, a, a even art school. So Did I Did you just, have any exhibitions in China, not, in New York no, at that time? No, I, I had once, but uh, nobody really uh, come to an exhibition. <laughs> uh, yes. I later I have to give all the works to to the gallery owner, you know, because nobody wants those work. And for, uh, for example, the portrait of Marcel Duchamp oh, in yes. the exhibition yes. is that a kind of that's kind of work, a, a kind of a uh, kind of souvenir of that period to some degree. It's true. And uh, that time in New York is a so-called a new expressionist, which. Uh, I have nothing, I don't even have... Those painters, I was very involved with that, I'm afraid. Okay. <laughs> I'm not even uh, the old expressionist, so it's, uh, it's too much for me. So I, 
they had a little article said, I always heart belongs to Dada and the serialism, which I'm a little bit happy about that little article. And uh, then I gave up art. I think I, I can never make it. So I, I still remember after one exhibition, I would take down the painting when I walk out, I see nobody, I would just throw in the garbage because it's too much to carry a canvas back to your apartment, and uh, which I have uh, maybe another hundred paintings there. It looks very silly to carry a canvas in the city. How did you make enough money for food and rent? Um, well, I, I worked uh, as a carpenter, as a, I did all kind of odd jobs, you know. If I name it, it will take the whole night, you know. I, I worked all kind of work. Yeah, I clean somebody's house or I even babysitting. I, <laughs> yeah, I did the uh, framing work, I did the uh, factory work, you know, I just trying to survive. It's, it's not so difficult to survive. But uh, also, you can never really uh, be, uh, feel safe in the city because you always have to worry about the rent and you have, and that which, you know, you, I don't want to become rich from a, from a very beginning. I never think that's uh, anything to do with me. So Did you visit the museums? Did you go to the Metropolitan yeah, I, Museum? I, I, I, I visit all the museums. Metropolitan Museum have a policy you can pay as, as uh, you wish, so I just spend one penny. And uh, you know the cashier look at me, I look at her, so she gave me a ticket, so I would go to there, spend uh, like half day there. Yeah. Did you look at Chinese art especially? No, or not, I, I look at African art or, you know, Metropolitan have a very good African collections, but, you know. Because they have wonderful Chinese collections of the Metropolitan Well, Museum. It's, it's okay, it's not so... It's a, <laughs> not so, good. Not so not impressive, so good. you know. But at that time, I mean, For, let's, let's yeah. come straight on to porcelain. I mean, why... <laughs> What is porcelain to you? And that's to say, I mean, porcelain has this extraordinary history. I mean, there was a very famous English historian called Joseph Needham, who, Needham, who wrote something like 15 volumes, huge volumes, on the history of Chinese science and, you know, the, adva the uh, as it were, the advanced nature of Chinese science. And one volume, which is something like 900 pages, is just devoted to the invention, basically, to the invention of porcelain, which of course is very different, or not different. Why don't you t tell us a little bit what the difference is in your, in your perception to pottery, ceramics, and porcelain, which of course in the West, and certainly in England, was known as China for obvious reasons. Well, it sounds like uh, British know more porcelain than Chinese which is not true. <laughs> I'm sure it is. <laughs> you know this book, by the way? No, no but, uh, but uh, uh, of course, uh, in England, there's a lot of uh, very admirable scholars, and uh, which um, and scholarly really know more about uh, Chinese art. Uh, uh, could it be bronze, jade, or porcelain? Porcelain is one of the... Um, practice in, in Asian China, and it's, uh, it's absolute rich, the highest um, art uh, craftsman or, or aesthetic um, height, which no other human being or nation or culture have ever reached in, in that uh, category. So, yeah, it's just uh, one character of Chinese culture. Porcelain. Uh, yeah, porcelain or you, jade you, or bronze. You know, if you make a comparison to the, the Asian uh, culture development uh, from uh, five, four thousand years ago, you know, you mm -hmm. can make a comparison to what happened in the, so in, the, in the Greek or, or later in Roman or in, or, in, or in Tang Dynasty, Yuan Dynasty or all the way. You make a comparison, but still, uh, China is so superb in terms of uh, highest aesthetic, uh, not only judgment, but uh, also craftsmanship. And technology. 
Technology, of course, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, and more than that is understanding the humans, uh, um, humans' relations in relating to material um, artifacts, which, sure. which is very, very profound. So when and, uh, of course, I don't understand all those. Uh, when I was in New York, you know, I, I never really paid any attention. Uh, thanks to my father's illness brought me back to China and doing nothing for years. So I started um, collecting and dealing with Chinese uh, Literally as, a, as an art dealer, as it were. As, um, as a trader. As a part-time mm -hmm. trader. Mm -hmm. But uh, of course, I also did many other things like underground book uh, uh, art, um, like I, I published books, editing books on contemporary Chinese art movement. That time is still underground. And I created the first uh, Chinese art space called uh, China Art Archives and Warehouse. And uh, you know it's a, it's kind of underground uh, contemporary art movement because that time in the 90s, uh, contemporary art in China still being seen as a Western spiritual pollution, and uh, to see that's uh, some kind of conspiracy from the West to to develop contemporary, uh, you know, so-called modern art. And tell us about your activities as a uh, collector. I mean, where did you find <laughs> things, and what did you find, and yeah. how did you learn through collecting? The, the second day I went back to China, my brother, who is a writer, and he brought me to antique market because he knows I will be bored in China, you know, because he knows I, how I, I, my, my life in New York. Uh, so he, he's worried, he said, he wanted me to stay longer, so he brought me to the antique market. And uh, the first trip, I, I see um, a few pieces of a wood in the corner. An uh, old man was uh, half sleeping Pieces there. of wood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I know it's a furniture piece, but it's not putting together. Mm. So I, I look at those wood, it's so heavy, you know, it's like a, it's like a metal. So mm. it's... Uh, it's kind of wood, uh, it's kind of, I don't know in the West, how do you call it? Some, someone would call it rosewood, but it's not a real name, but it's a very hard wood. And uh, it's a Ming Dynasty furniture, which means already a few hundred years old. But Chinese furniture, they are, they are putting together with very special joints. So you can take apart easily and put back. You don't need glue, you don't need a, you don't need uh, any kind of screw or nails. It, it will stand like... Uh, like a puzzle. Yeah, like a puzzle. It's exactly like a puzzle. Mm. And uh, that will stand for hundreds of years. And they, because they understand the nature of the wood, they make the joint very, very intelligent. And uh, one locks another. And, uh, you know, it have a very clear discipline and uh, craftsmanship. That kind of beauty I first time experienced. So I bought that, it's only $100, which, you know, I, I think is very, very low price. And uh, so since then, I got uh, really involved in, with uh, antiquity. So what did you do with this object? It's still... You still, still have it? It stays uh, next you to my bed. Yes, you still own it? You still have it? Of course, of course. Yeah. I still have it. I will never let it go. And uh, it's quiet and uh, very uh, proportionally, and uh, you know the craftsmanship uh, are so beautiful in the very quiet way. And uh, since then, I start to uh, discover porcelain, jade, or fabric, or uh, furniture, or you know, all aspect. But I only like. So, in spite of the Cultural Revolution, a met. lot of artifacts survived. <laughs> Did the skills survive too? Um, amongst pe amongst uh, enough people, Culturally, because I think this, this exhibition, is very interesting. this exhibition is a manifestation in many ways that the great old skills survive. So-called cultural re revolution in China, we have to destroy everything old. 
you know, the right guard can go to any home. If they see there's porcelain or blue and white, they just would wipe it off uh, from the table and the crash right in front of any collector or any, uh, any home. So I think uh, millions of uh, things been destroyed, even temples been destroyed or paintings, anything can be just directly teared. But out. not everything has been destroyed. Everything. everything you, you, you, no, I mean, uh, if you uh, go to the palace, uh, oh. you know, I mean, the great, a lot of things still survive in well, China. Well, if you, you belong to emperor's uh, collection, it's not destroyed. Mm -hmm. But in the household or in the, in the average family, which is a lot of, collect of course, collecting yeah. and uh, all burned, all the, they even put all the books uh, into water, you know, because all those books in the water then all destroyed. Were things hidden by huh? people? Did people hide things? No, to hide things is very big crime. You know, that means your counter-revolution, you're not, uh, that's very dangerous to hide anything old. So how were the antique markets? Where, the did, antique this, markets, where, did, this, where did the antique, material come from? Antique uh, markets booming because uh, China started to build. They build uh, roads, they build buildings everywhere. So dig out a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, antiquity. You know, this is... Uh, Through archaeology? Uh, oh, yes. A kind is, of archaeology? Uh, well, it's not archaeology. Just farmers but, found out something under his... Uh, uh, you know, uh, his uh, plants, like uh, uh, how do you call those kind of plants? So whenever the the autumn come, when plants start to grow, then that's the time they can dig because nobody see them. I mean, they're hiding in those plants, so they they would have you know dig out all kind of artifacts and they they sell in the market. If you sell one piece will be much more, um, you know, they make much more profit than the selling the whole years of uh, uh, agriculture products. So, for example, at the very end of the exhibition, there's a very beautiful kind of carpet of uh, those tiger fragments. I would call them the tiger fragments. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Did you find them all together, or did you find them one by one? I, I find it uh, gradually, but not I find them. I, I ask, you know, their market in the, in certain area, I've, I find a motif with these tigers on the, on the bottom of this broken vases. I said, I like the motif. So then after I continue buy that, the whole town knows this one person just wants that single motive, so take years, I collect a lot. You know, they always would call up to see I have 50 of them, or in my cousin's home, could I have another 30 of them. So I, I said, okay, just bring it over, you know. So, you know, that's how those work have been made. So tell me a little bit about your understanding of the meaning of ornament in Chinese art and particularly in, you know, the kind of geometrical ornament, the, the curly ornament, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, which you're very good at imitating. I'm very interested in your concept of imitation and fakery. I mean, this word fake is quite a big word in your life. But at the same time, I have to say, when I look at some of the works in the exhibition, do you think fake is bad, or is fake good? Or, don't you, or do you think it's just, I mean, is there any difference between the real and the fake, if it's good, and good enough? Because I actually think, the, you know, the glazes, the painting, you know, for example, if you look at the beautiful work, the one work in the exhibition that is a work, I think it's a 17th century uh, King Dynasty piece from Topkapi, hmm? Uh, and then you look at the imitation, the two imitations on either side. I can't tell the difference. I can, or at least if I can, if I can barely tell the difference. Can you, in terms uh, of the quality of the ornament, the quality of the glazes, of the quality I, of you know the shaping and so on? Of course, I can tell the difference because I faked it, and. Uh, <laughs> And uh, fake is not necessarily bad in Chinese culture, especially. Fake is a way to capture 
the so-called re real. And as long cover the what? I'm sorry. Fake is a, a company to the real. It's uh -huh. try to capture the spirit of the, the real. real. And the Chinese culture always learning from the the master's piece. So you you always make work trying to to to reach the height. You you even. Um, you know, put on your painting, say this painting is a fake of another painting which happened in 300 years ago. So as long as you announce that it's, it's, a, it's a fake, that's a, that's, a, that's a way of learning the past. And uh, you know, today the fake is wrong because it's just faking, seeking some kind of profit or lie to people. But in the history of China, if you, you you practice calligraphy or or Chinese painting or or make a jade. You know Song Dynasty always fake the the uh, Shang Dynasty or or calligraphy. Also later people always trying to fake the earlier one. So actually in China, they understand art is fake of the reality. You know, it's art is not a reality, but it's is a commentary or interpre uh, interpretation of the reality. So the so fake. art is fake. Huh? So the fake, all art is fake, is what you say? I think all art is fake. It, it's just some are good fakes and some bad fakes. No, I wouldn't disagree with that. So well, that's that's why you don't understand art that much. I mean, a lot of my questions are a lot of my questions are rhetorical. For example, if you look at ancient Egyptian art, you have this idea it's all the same. But actually, there's a, you know, if you, I remember once being, spending a lot of time with, you know, the director of an, uh, Egyptian antiquities at the British Museum. He taught me that actually each dynasty has subtle differences. And so you begin to kind of appreciate, Not as a way, the way a kind of culture that is 5,000 years old and that on the surface doesn't seem to change at all is actually full of very, very subtle changes of uh, nuance and Should so on. Should we talk about something else? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but do you think that's true in China too? Do you think that's true in China with glazes and, and motifs and e so on? Each, Dragon motifs each, or whatever? Yeah, each dynasty uh, have a clear definition about its own aesthetics. It's so clear. It, it reflects on the every part of the porcelain, um, on the body, on the mouth, on the, f on the footing, on the, you know, the way the play, the glaze, or the drawing, or even the, the writing signature. Each dynasty has very different style, and no, nobody can really replace it.